since six o'clock on September 19th. I'll call this meeting of the select board to order. First thing up is Finance Committee Renee Burbick. Uh, she told me she was going to join us on Zoom. Um, I don't see her on Zoom right now. Um, so maybe we can table it, and if she comes on later, we can table code additions and deletions. Uh, so we wanted two things tonight. Um, one is a conversation uh, and a decision potentially of purchasing finance and an excavator for the DPW department. Um, the other is uh, a conversation about starting a working group uh, over the Woodstock Aqueduct uh, that a citizen requested to have. Uh, so I request both those get added, um, probably both under new business. And we're deleting the Board of Sewer Commissioners. Yes, that's right. Yeah, there's no, nothing on the Board of Sewer Commissions for today. Thank you, Susan. That's how we email back and forth ahead of time. Um, citizens' comments. Any online comments? Managers report. Um, so, a few things. Uh, one, um, I'm happy to report that the uh, town made an offer um, and had a candidate. Uh, accept the offer for a finance director for Woodstock. Um, the person is going to start in two weeks. Uh, we're excited about the potential of having this person on board. Uh, we think it could be a good fit for Woodstock and really help us kind of move forward and kind of get our finances in a shape that uh, is more understandable for everyone. Uh, I'll have more news once the person starts and we'll have a formal introduction to the community and everything else once uh, he's on board. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, second, uh, I talked to the chair already. Uh, I'll be at um, the International Cities and Managers Conference Saturday, September 30th to October 4th. Um, so I will be on Zoom for the select board meeting that Tuesday, um, but I'll be able to participate via that way. Um, and Nikki Nurse can staff the board ahead of time to make sure we're all set. Um, finally, um, talking about the uh, Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, John Spector was able to use his connections and the Harvard Business School has agreed to work with the town to analyze the options of what should happen with the Woodstock Aqueduct Company um, and kind of answer some questions uh, I put together for them on what a purchase would look like, what's the cost benefit of purchasing the company or not purchasing the company, um, and some other questions as well. So we're going to have an outside group of you know, future scholars and prior presidents uh, working for us. So I think that'll be hopefully a good thing for us. And for free. And for free. Yes. Um, so um, that's what we have there. Um, finance reports uh, you have in front of you. Um, again, it's still pretty early days, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Susan Ford was kind enough to answer ask questions uh, beforehand, which I hopefully answered to her liking. Uh, but anything else, I'm happy to take on. Questions? Local license permit. No questions. Um, so, um, as before, uh, I know the board's frustration with the way the local license applications look like. They give you us no information. Um, I think the last conversation we had was not to even include them because it gave us no information. Um, I think the motion has always been for the board to approve it with. The assumption the state's going to do the due diligence afterwards. Um, this is for the Aguachi um, Yacht Club. Uh, so, looking to section off an area outside and have picking tables and be able to have alcohol served out there as well. Um, so, I think it's still on the board to go from there. So, a motion? To the, I just had a quick question. Do they, they must need. Some kind of zoning permit. As yep, well. they have a zoning permit. Uh, that's all set out in front of me. So I would move we approve the Ottaquichi Yacht Club outside consumption permit based upon the assumption that the state is actually reviewing the applications since we can't. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? None? Okay. Fine. None? Old business. Uh, Cal Lane Road. Um, 
so as the board voted on a few months ago, uh, we're, the town's closing Cleveland Road starting this Saturday up until I believe October 15th. Um, myself, Mark Hunter, the DPO director, and Chief Green were out there last week looking at options to set up uh, some no parking signs and some no parking areas to kind of help avoid people parking there, then trying to walk up, um, which is obviously what we'd all want to avoid. Uh, Mark Hunter today was able to get a um, a sign that'll go in front of Billings Farm, uh, letting people know that it's closed. So ideally, they can turn around at that point instead of going all the way to Cloudland Road and then going to Tassel Bridge, which I know we were worried about. Um, so that's going to be in place. We'll pick that up on Friday. I have that going by Saturday, um, and then we'll see how the first weekend goes and make make adjustments from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Happy Any questions? No, but that's gotten quite a bit of press coverage, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Ray, I have a question. This is Kathy Emmons. Go ahead. Um, just wondering, so did you want us to put some parking signs near the cemetery wall? And we also wanted to just barrel off and put no parking signs for that parking area so it doesn't get congested with cars. Yeah, I think the conversation we had when we were out there that uh, Mark Hunter was going to put up some barrels uh, and he's here to that in that uh, dirt area to avoid okay. parking there. Um, if, if Pomfret has extra signs, uh, we'd be happy to take them and set them up where we can. Uh, we don't have an excess of signs, so we'd be happy to take those and, and try to put them where we can. Okay, yeah, we do have some pomfret set up all of their signs and things today, and we have we'll do the final barricade signs um, Saturday morning. We have some of the neighbors going down to just move them into the road up here. So um, we can. I think Jimmy Potter does have a few more no parking signs. So we could, do you want us to leave them there or what What would you like to do? Would you like us to put them up along the cemetery? Uh, Mark, you're going to be up there Friday, right? Yes, I'll set up the barrel Friday afternoon. I'll sign so forth yeah. Friday late in the afternoon. So Mark Hunter will be up there in the afternoon on Friday. So if you want to maybe uh, leave him uh, or can you meet him sometime in the afternoon on Friday? Uh, I can. I have to be at work um, around three o'clock up at our restaurant. So, Mark, if we could meet around one, that would be awesome. Does that work? Yes, that works, Mark. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. New business uh, schedule for budget hearing. That yeah, so uh, I believe today you, the uh, both boards, the uh, site board and trustee, you should have got an email from Nikki Nurse asking about setting up uh, our kickoff meeting for the budget for FY25. Um, the goal of that meeting is to have department heads coming from the boards kind of discuss FY23 accomplishments, uh, the needs and challenges for FY24, and then also kind of long term challenges they see as well. So just the boards are aware of what the asks will be in the budget and why those asks are in the budget. Um, kind of have a little more informational session before we get into actual the, the, num the number crunching. Uh, once that meeting is scheduled, uh, we'll then schedule a meeting with the Finance Advisory Board and the department heads for about an hour uh, afterwards so they can first meet and go from there. Um, and then we'll kind of kick into a schedule when the budget I do back in my office and to the boards and so on and so forth. So it's really nailing down that first meeting that we can then kind of plan everything off that. All right, thank you. Any questions on that from the board? Update from the National Parks. Come on up. Uh, right here, I have this little microphone if you can. All right, so thank you everyone. Rick Kendall, uh, National Park Service over so at uh, Marsh Billings Rockefeller. Um, just- uh, We might take like one more step forward so you can see yeah. you in the camera. Perfect. You don't need to sit at the table. No, you say if you want, what are you more comfortable with? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll sit. It's fine. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Can everyone online hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. 
So uh, working with Eric over the uh, course of the last uh, month or so, we uh, recently signed a renewal of the cooperative management agreement between the town uh, and the National Park Service. And the management agreement allows national parks to uh, work more closely with uh, towns that share land borders uh, with national park land as we do with like the Billings Farm, or not the Billings Farm, the Billings Park. Um, and allows us to work uh, collaboratively to manage not only park lands, but also uh, town lands as well. And we've been really pleased to work with the town over the course of the last five years of the uh, agreement. And in particular, uh, Zoe Parent, who has been really uh, key to uh, uh, a lot of the work that we have done, at least on the, the financial side. And we uh, hope to enjoy many future years of collaboration together. And Eric suggested that uh, uh, sharing some of those uh, highlights from the last five years would probably be of interest to uh, not only the board, but to uh, town members as well. So I'm here to, to share a few of those things with you. Uh, the focus of the agreement has been uh, sort of four uh, core areas. One of, one of them is uh, trail stewardship, both at the park and at the Billings Farm, or I said it again, Billings Park. Um, and so for the past several years, uh, it, the agreement has facilitated uh, securing a uh, series of trail crews of uh, six youth with like uh, either the SCA or the BYCC uh, that have completed trail stewardship projects both uh, on park land as well as uh, national park land as well as Billings Park uh, land as well and that includes things like uh, tread rehabilitation and uh, drainage enhancements and brushing and some invasive species work uh, and resurfacing um, and uh, most of this work was accomplished through uh, the NPS obtaining funds through some of our fund sources and then uh, working with the town to bring on the, uh, the youth crews that then uh, do the work at uh, both Billings Park and the National Park. And it's been a great uh, success going forward. Uh, we also have a public safety element to uh, the agreement, which allows us to uh, uh, convey funds to the town for their assistance in providing uh, public safety services at the park, whether it's alarm response or uh, jumping uh, in on busy event days for providing some traffic control on Elm Street and the crossing from the Billings Farm and Museum parking lot where most of our visitors park. Um, probably the largest tranche of uh, success stories from this uh, agreement has been in uh, uh, stewardship and education, uh, partnership with the uh, Woodstock schools. Um, we've had a long and productive partnership with the Woodstock schools, advancing place-based education programs that connect local students to the park and to Billings Park and to King Farm. Um, and uh, through that agreement, we provide half of the salary for Woodstock Union High School's place-based learning coordinator, Kat Robbins, who many of you may know, uh, who supports both teachers and students with their work directly. Um, and CAT is really such a dynamo that uh, it's some of the most impactful money that we spend uh, each year is uh, supporting CAT and her work. And just uh, uh, a couple of the highlights there, CAT's uh, been collaborating uh, with over a dozen teachers in different dis disciplines and with uh, uh, a small core uh, in her place-based education team on developing a uh, program called CRAFT, C-R-A-F-T, which stands for Climate and Community Resilience Through Agriculture, Forestry, and Technology, which is uh, essentially a track that students at Woodstock Union can uh, follow that uh, uh, you know, provides them with hands-on interdisciplinary learning experiences to, ignite, or to uh, uh, advance their knowledge in uh, those areas that uh, community resilience and agriculture and forestry and technology. Uh, and uh, uh, over 30 students over the two years the program has been in place have uh, participated. There have been three off-campus student learning retreats, three career panels, nine teacher professional development uh, sessions have come out of this work. And it's really uh, turning into a very impactful uh, project that, that Kat has been leading. Uh, Kat also works outside of that program with just, uh, you know, more uh, uh, one-time uh, opportunities that come up, things like designing solutions for ecological monitoring challenges at the National Park, uh, service learning projects for students. Uh, one led to uh, maple sugaring operations at the King Farm, which is uh, uh, exciting stuff. Um, researching and designing and implementing a student-designed pollinator garden at the National Park Service Forest Center. Um, 
constructing and building a maternity bat house uh, and interpretive material again on display at the national park so just a lot of different uh, great engagement opportunities for students uh, at Woodstock Union uh, Middle and High School, and we're really thankful to, to have Kat as part of that team. Uh, and then the last uh, pillar of work that uh, occurs as part of this agreement is uh, shared landscape care, particularly of the uh, green mowed lawn areas along uh, Elm Street and Route 12 uh, that border the park and, and the, uh, the roadway. Um, but uh, just a sampling of some of the work that has gone on over the last five years. We're very happy to uh, have the agreement renewed and we look forward to another productive five years of working with the town. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Great. Halloween candy discussion. So. I think this is a yearly uh, thing. Um, the trustees last meeting voted uh, for $750 to be allocated uh, to buy candy for the section off uh, streets during Halloween. Um, I think the ask is for the select board to do something similar. I'd move we give 750 for uh, that's the amount, right? Yes. For Halloween. Candy. I, would, I would second. All those in favor? Aye. Hi. Um, before we move on, uh, I believe Renee is online. If we want to hop back quickly, uh, to talk to her. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello. Hi. Okay. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are interested in this position? Um, well, I have. I am a branch manager of a bank, so I have some financial um, background. Um, I've also done taxes and have been a business manager of a small business. Um, so I have some accounting background as well. And I live in town and active in the community. So I thought, why not jump on board and see how else I can help? Um, have you been to any of the meetings? I was at one the last week, yes. And you'll be able to make the meetings as needed? Yeah, I can make the meetings. Any other questions? Any questions? It's just one vacancy, is that? Yeah. Really? No, no, no. So if there's no questions, we can take a vote. Any other applicants? No. I'd move we um, point Renee Hebert Herbert. Well, I do need to to the Hebert. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. And Renee, you have a, the trustees in I think two or three weeks, and they'll once they vote on you, you'll be official. Sure. I look forward to it. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. And now we have a presentation from Jeff Grow. That's me. Um, yeah, do you want to come sit up, sure. sit up here? Sure. Um, this was my understanding was supposed to be a introduction of you originally. Okay. And we can't and and Sustainable Woodstock has been doing this for a while. We can't take things like we, we need things Thursday before the meeting so we have a chance to review them. Oh, okay. Okay, so sure. this will be the last time. Um, next time it'll be just have a nice night. See you later. Got it. No, I apologize. I didn't know that, but um, well, now you do. I do now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll give you about 10 minutes. So okay. Yeah. Oh, this great. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, can you uh, give Jeff the ability to share the screen? Did you see already? Oh, yeah. Never mind, Nikki. Got it. Great. Sorry, Nikki. You're ahead of me. Okay. What do we see up here? I can hide this. And everybody can hear me okay? 
All right, I'm uh, the Intermunicipal Regional Energy Coordinator for, I work for Two Rivers. We've had a great partnership with Woodstock and Sustainable Woodstock for the last couple of years. We've got some nice energy projects going through, so we just thought we would um, review those real quick. There's, you have copies of the presentation, and so I'm going to kind of talk through this pretty quick. But if there are any questions, let me know. And people on the screen can see this as yep. well. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Who the heck is Jeff Grout? Well, I just wanted to let you know who I was real quick. I've been in the utility industry for about 10 years. I'm a certified energy manager and project manager. And the main thing that I think is important to Woodstock is basically I'm serving you as an independent energy um, consultant. So I, I work on energy projects. I've got a lot of experience working different EE projects um, around the country, basically worked on some EV programs and some demand response programs. And um, just excited to work on the programs we have going for Woodstock right now also. So. And I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So if there are questions, I think you can go ahead and fire away. Um, what are my goals? Basically, we I track the, the energy um, energy usage of the town and the carbon emissions. We've got quite a few projects going on right now, which we'll discuss. And the main thing is whenever you get an energy project, you know how much money you spend up front. You're usually told how much energy you're going to save. And one thing I like to do is to track that and make sure you're actually seeing those savings. And I do have to say that in the last few years, or you know, probably more than a few years actually, but the energy improvement, the way they calculate energy savings is really improved. So if you're working with a good contractor, you're probably going to get pretty accurate results of what's going to happen. But the main goals are I look for energy savings. I look for grants that can help to save the town money. And, um, reduce your energy spend if we can. So, oh, page down. So the first one we've got going, the, this project was completed last year. It's actually the Woodstock Emergency Services Building. Um, IREC was instrumental in getting a $50,000 energy efficiency grant for this project. Um, it's got air to air and air to water cold climate heat pumps. Um, it does still have a propane system that will be used for backup heating if needed in the winter. Um, it's gonna cut down on propane use drastically. This is the winter we'll really see if those savings um, come to fruition. Uh, basically it, it was calculated savings of 81% in propane use. And basically I think it might even be less than that because that will probably be a background. You've got a really efficient heat pump system there. So uh, it really should be able to handle the heating most of the time. It also included some real, uh, what they call super insulation in the building. Um, this type of building with open bays, doors that open and close are sometimes a challenge, but um, with proper management, this should be a really good efficient building and you should really see these savings. So one key thing I'll be doing over this winter, this would be the heating system wasn't actually completed and up and running until May, no heating last year. So this is the year we'll really see some heating savings in that building. And we'll be tracking that pretty closely to make sure that we actually get the heating uh, the, cal the heating savings that they um, calculated, which they should. We're also uh, the electric school bus grant. Uh, this is pretty exciting. I think actually it was a $1.6 million grant. It um, provided three electric buses. It paid for them 100%. It paid for most of the charging system. There's gonna be a charging system down at the Woodstock High School. And um, I think the one cost that the um, school district had was to run the power from the pole to the charging station location. And then the grant covers the rest of those costs. Um, the thing I like to focus with the electric school buses is this really, these buses are really a large electric battery on wheels. And there's some exciting programs they're trying. They've got a few um, sample cases in other regions in New England where you can actually drive the school bus and use it to power a building for days, usually because um, of, the, of the size of the battery. So it really helps with your community resilience programs. When you have a real emergency and there's no power, these buses can actually be driven to where you need the power and plugged in. Um, that's, I don't know of any actually in New Hampshire yet but 
um, they're all around us, and that's um, a multi-purpose use. I think when it comes to energy systems and energy savings, whenever you have multi-use systems, it, it's really beneficial. So it's not just moving the kids around and getting them to school. It's actually powering, um, it can power buildings during emergencies as well. So that's what I think is exciting. That excites me anyway. So um, this is an ongoing program and there's, I think everybody's probably aware of this because the, the funds were approved, approved um, quite a while ago. The project's been delayed a little bit because of um, the flooding this year. It was scheduled to start earlier in the season. Um, basically, it's an energy upgrade at the wastewater treatment facility, the DPW building, the old fire station in the welcome center. Um, the energy components, excuse me, are pretty similar to what happened at the emergency services building, excuse me, where we're going to upgrade the insulation, do some air sealing, install LED lighting, um, heat pumps. Uh, the real feature here, I think, too, is a, a direct digital control system so that they'll be able to control the buildings from a remote location and um, optimize the energy savings and the energy use at all of the buildings remotely. So, um, and again, the, the real key here is to get the project done, but then also to make sure that we actually achieve the energy savings. So we'll be documenting all that as well. And this was calculated to save greenhouse gas emissions by about 12% and also cut down dramatically, basically eliminating fossil fuel use at these buildings, um, except in times of real extreme cold weather. Oops. The other um, re very recent update is the Municipal Energy Resilience Program. This is um, an opportunity worth up to $500,000 awarded for weatherization and HVAC upgrades to municipal buildings. And uh, this is in three stages. There's a mini grant stage, an energy assessment stage, and then the actual project grant of the up to $500,000 to upgrade your energy systems in your building. We applied for and were awarded the $4,000 mini grant that can be used for a number of different energy purposes, energy consultant, energy studies. Um, it can be used to pay part of my fee, apparently. So um, that's always something to uh, consider. And um, the big news is we were, that you were just awarded an energy assessment for this building. And this is completely funded by the state of Vermont. There's no cost at all to Woodstock. It'll give you a very um, professional energy assessment of the building. And anything that's stated on that report can be used to get the $500,000 grant to um, actually do the upgrades that they find. So uh, that's kind of a priority at this point. We wanna really try to um, win that grant and go forward. But the next step is the energy assessment um, I think you just got notified this week for that. Yeah, they're going to approve, yeah. Okay, so that probably puts you out about six weeks um, to get that. I think the next slide, if you can even see this, is a little bit of a timeline, but we are right at the very beginning of this timeline, so the assessment started. Just to get a quick idea of when this would actually happen, the good news here is the money is already in the state, and the, the state really is prioritizing um, getting these grants out. So. Um, this that's that's good news going forward. The um, applications for the energy assessment can be open as soon as probably fourth quarter of this year after you get the assessments. Um, the asset the energy assessment can also be used to look for other funding, other loans, other grants that might be available, and we'll certainly look for that as we go forward once we know exactly what the building needs. I think there's been quite a bit of work done here already, so it's probably not going to uncover too much more than is already known about the building and what it needs. But this stresses um, weatherization and energy systems, specifically upgrading heating systems, trying to reduce fossil fuel usage in municipal buildings. It does not cover structural. So um, roofing, any any structural issues, that that is not covered. But it is a good, very good loan for um, internal energy systems. And coming up, um, this is really my last slide, so I went through this pretty quickly, but that's probably good news for everybody. The meeting's moving pretty quick tonight anyway. So, um, But I will continue to monitor energy savings and energy usage. We'll cut down on that. Um, 
I might have missed the slide, but did, did I show the slide with the Woodstock souls after mine? Yeah, I, I somehow skipped over. I wanted to make sure you know what goals I'm working toward because I have my goals, but basically they match Woodstock's goals. Did I show the slide or not over that? So, you know, that that's really the high level of what we're working toward, which is um, these were approved by the voters of the town to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, um, ready for 100, which is 100% renewable energy and transition as much as possible from fossil fuels to renewable energy. But, um, you know, we want to make sure our goals are aligned. The, the big thing here is we're looking for grants that will save the town energy and also energy savings. And a key part of that is making sure we know where that energy is spent right now. Um, one thing that's interested, interesting is the energy spend. I should have had the, the actual number with me, which I don't. I apologize. But what was surprising to me is that um, your town is similar to most of the town. I work with six other towns in the region, and every town spends over half of their energy spend is on actual the fleet vehicles, which is um, any vehicles you have for the town, but mostly snow plows, road, road equipment, things like things like that more than you spend on actually heating your buildings. So that was interesting. Maybe it's obvious to you, but to me, it was a little bit of a surprise. So um, that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Any questions? I do. Yes. Uh, the buses, how do you hook them up to a different building? Do they have to have a receptacle? Yes, they do. Yeah, it's like- it's Gotta be up to the- Absolutely, right, yeah. And that, I, I don't wanna say that that's gonna be ready to plug in as soon as you get them. That's a project that'll be down the road. Okay. And it's similar to like shore power on a ship, for example, when a ship, big ship comes into port, they like to shut down their diesel engines and plug in this huge, Right. and it won't be that big, but yeah, <laughs> yeah it'll be, you know, large enough so you can, can do that. And I think that really is going to happen, so. And you say it can power buildings for days? I mean, like what, like. Well, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to have a hundred percent of your heat on and all your buildings right. on, but you could power your critical equipment, you know, keep the building warm enough so your pipes don't freeze. Um, you'd want to reduce your lighting. If you have LED lighting, you could probably use quite a bit of your lighting, actually, but it would power your most of your emergency equipment and um, keep the pipes from freezing, basically. So, and that's that's a little bit of a, you know, that's a little bit of a technical jump away, but things are happening so quickly now, and they're doing it now. It's not just something they're dreaming about. They're actually doing that, so. So the bus, actually, it can't charge itself. Right. No, this would have to be fully charged. It would have to be fully right, charged. Yeah. And, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. But you could, once once we get those and work with them a little bit, we'll know how much power they have, and we can calculate really what you can run and for how long. So, and then if you had to, with two or three buses and you had one critical building, you could just keep bringing the buses in and maybe drive them someplace to recharge them. You know, someplace that does have power, you could drive them there, recharge them, and bring them back. So, a lot of possibilities there, I think. But to me, that was a really cool part with the buses. It's not just the driving around because, you know, these buses, you pay a lot of money for those and they're sitting somewhere doing nothing most of the year, all summer, most of the day even. You know, they drive they have their routes, what, one or two hours. So that's a good feature, I think. Any other questions? Roger, come on up. Yeah. Oh, Roger, Roger, come Roger, on. Roger, mind oh, coming up so we can... Uh, Yes. People know who you are. <laughs> um, going forward, would it be possible for this kind of for this kind of report to include a lot more detail in terms of in terms of actual numbers? For example, whatever we're going to spend on implementing a project of this mm -hmm. nature, what amount is coming from outside sources? What amount is coming from tax? What amount is coming from bonds? What is the long-term cost on each for for each the ongoing cost, the ongoing operating cost each year, whether debt service or or just managing and and controlling the equipment? Um, and then also from the same perspective, and I realize you probably haven't quite gotten there yet, the actual establishing the baseline energy usage mm -hmm. and then the actual savings that are coming in yep. um, and and comparing that to the cost so that we can really do kind of a cost benefit. Absolutely. Analysis yeah. No, the, the baseline we have 
Um, what we don't have is these projects just aren't at the level yet where we've taken data to see them. But yeah, we'll have that going forward. Okay. As far as when the project's being done and what funding came from town budget and grants, I mean, we'll we'll know that. But I think I would know the grant part and what it costs. But I think some of that would have to come down as well. So. Yeah, it just would be useful to be able to put together. All oh, yeah, no, that's because that's, yeah. some of this is debt service. Some of yep. this is ongoing yep. maintenance. And, yep. and I understand you may not actually you're not running the equipment. So right. you may not have that. But, right. Yeah. But if, if if we could work together to come up with kind of a rolled up. Sure. Essentially GL on energy. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that, that's that's um, a goal. And, OK, and that's, great. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next time we'll talk about uh, the excavator. Yeah. Um, Mark, do you want to? Um, so in front of uh, the board, and I'm not sure if Carrie has one. So if Carrie, you don't have one, I apologize. Um, is a proposal for the town to uh, finance an excavator. Um, and the way this would work is we would, um, have our backhoe be uh, bought back uh, for $70,000 and then lease for about $124,000 the excavator. Um, the way we paid for it this year is there are scheduled, uh, there was money budgeted for uh, loan payments that do not need to be paid, uh, one of them being the backhoe itself. So we just reallocate that money towards the, the $27,000 uh, that will be for this year. Um, and then going forward, the select board have to budget for it for the next four years. Um, so that's a commitment the board have to make if they choose to go forward with this, that knowing the next four years, you'd have to budget that money each year to pay it off. Um, so it's really a net uh, zero finance uh, for this year. Um, Mark can speak more to this, but uh, it's his belief, and I, I support him, that having this machine instead of the backhoe will allow them to work quicker, faster, more efficient get more done. Uh, I've been here for eight months. I believe we've rented an excavator two or three times already. We borrowed the aqueduct excavator a few times just because the sale of the, the amount of work we have to do, the backhoe just can't do it or it takes four days instead of one day. Um, so it's our belief that this will really help our DPW get stuff done quicker, faster, uh, and be a net benefit to the whole community. I don't know if Mark wants to add anything else to it. So what, uh, as Eric pointed out, um, what I could get done with the backhoe, if it takes three or four days, um, the rubber tire excavator, I can get that done on basically a day or two. Um, this past flood uh, in July was, I wouldn't say it's hectic. Um, I felt honored to help the town in the first two weeks that we were hit with the flood. Um, that I don't feel as though those first two weeks, it wasn't hectic for me. Um, what was hectic for myself was those following two weekends. Um, I got the town up to snuff, fixing the roads, um, and then I released the contractors that were working with me. Um, it was very difficult. Um, once I let them go, they went, they moved on to other towns that were in need. Um, at that point, all I had was my crew and the equipment that we have. Um, that was, that was difficult to fix everything. The, the, those following two weekends where we got the heavy rain, um, having a rubber tire excavator that's similar to a, a backhoe, um, the specs on the, the uh, rubber tire excavator that we're presenting to the town, it will travel 27 miles an hour down the road. Um, it's not, it's kind of a in-between model. That's not huge. It's not a mini excavator. So um, it won't take up two lanes of travel on a back road. It can sit right there while traffic can merge around. Um, I've watched um, the operation that we currently use where the, the backhoe takes up the whole road and it's 
he's limited on, on his swing and he has a, a, a six wheeler dump truck where he has to load it. So if I'm the operator in the rubber tire excavator, I can sit right there on the side of the road and do my ditching and I can have a, a dump truck right behind me. So I can ditch the side of the road and I could swing 180 degrees and load the truck behind me. And I continue to work. Um, it will take me a day or two what it will take the backhoe three or four days. Um, I think it's a huge asset to the to the town. Um, I think it will be beneficial during snow removal. Um, currently, right now, every winter, the backhoe sits all winter long. So right now, I have an operator go out in the in, in the evening around 11 or 12, 11 or 12 o'clock. The town's loader goes down down goes downtown and starts to back drag a lot of the snow off the sidewalks. You have a giant bucket off of a front end loader. It's limited to how how what he can get on on the sidewalk. So you have parking meters, trees down there. Um, at that point, I need to have a contractor with his equipment helping out on snow removal. Um, I think it would be a lot. Um, it will help if all the town employees have been plowing snow for two days and then we have to do snow removal. You know, everybody's tired, we're getting grumpy. And then we have to do snow removal. Um, it would speed things up a lot with that also. Um, I think the the trade in value on the back on the backhoe is a is a um, it's a, a great number. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Um, I think having a rubber tire excavator, it would be better going down, down going forward for the town. Um, if there's, and if we have an issue looking for um, future employee, um, the backhoe is, it's a little outdated. There's a lot of the uh, equipment manufacturers, they don't even produce uh, backhoes. Okay. Any questions? I think this would be a good, good investment. You know, we don't see very many. A lot of towns now are getting, getting excavators and and rubber tired. I think makes it even more useful. You don't have to trailer it. You don't yeah. have to worry about the asphalt getting. I know a lot of the other towns in the in the area. They have they do all their ditching with a with a track a steel track excavator. Um, something that we would need. Um, equivalent to this, it would have to be trailered around town. Um, there's only a couple of my employees that have a class A license. So if we were to purchase something equivalent to that, and then we would have to also purchase um, a trailer to move it. So again, this, this, the, the Volvo excavator, the rubber tire excavator, it, it, goes right down the road, just like our backhoe. And I think I understood from Eric that it was hard to find one. So it was, it was difficult to, many to find one. <laughs> um, I started to um, look around to a, a couple other um, manufacturers. Um, it's just, it, it's tough right now because of the flood. So um, a lot of them are out on, on, um, on rent. Um, so this is um, it, the sales guy that I that I that I was speaking with. He was very. Um, he would get right back to me and everything. So. What yeah. year is the backhoe? It's a 2018. So that's going to need to be replaced anyway, but at yeah. some point. Yeah. But. Um, Hardly anyone uses a backhoe yeah, anymore. It's a lot more efficient. I think it would be great. And I see these guys cleaning ditches, and we gotta sit and wait for them to move out of the way. And feel I'm bad because the next parent they get set up to do it. I think it would be get 
it's uh, so if, if I schedule my work or if I'm thinking in my head how to go forward and it, I, I try to group the, the, the guys together. So I, I can't grade a road until the backhoe goes out there to clean out some of the ditches. Um, granted, the, our grader can do some of them, but where there's a culvert, that's where the backhoe has to go out prior to having the, gro the road graded. Um, so what the, what I can perform with the backhoe, I, I, I have to wait for the grader to go out there where having a rubber tire excavator, it would speed everything up. I'll make a motion that oh, we, uh, what, oh, sorry, I, oh, sorry. I, I wasn't I mean, it up. sounds like, like kind of a no brainer in terms of to the extent that I understand what you're talking about, yes. um, that it's a piece of equipment that will allow you to save staff time, which is probably more important than anything else. Um, just as a general question, and this is probably more for Eric, um, as we move forward with this kind of thing, have we started to look at sharing with other, with other towns or organizations? So um, that's a great question. When it comes to DPW, we have not. We started to do with, with IT services, I think, and this is the first time I'm answering this question, so I could be wrong. I think one of the issues with DPW is we're all facing the same weather conditions at the same time. So what Pomfret has, yeah. what Harvard has, we Obviously all need you can't share plots. the same thing, yeah. Um, so I think that would be an issue. Um, I think if it came to a piece of equipment that we didn't need all the time, I'd be very happy to look at sharing services with our community. Or, or I mean, another thing I've seen people do is a number of towns will get together and buy three or right. something so that you know, you don't have one for every town necessarily, but you have one quarter for every town or yeah. something like that. So I would just like to make sure that we keep looking at that going forward. Absolutely. When we're talking about this kind of investment. Yeah. So point, my, my background, I've got a couple of construction, I a construction background. So typically in a, in a large construction company, every operator, he pretty much has his own pick of uh, his own piece of equipment. Uh -huh. So that saves on maintenance. If you care about your piece of equipment or um, you're gonna take care of it. If you, if you share a piece of equipment with other towns, it's, it's not gonna last long. Okay, I just like to keep, keep I, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's downsides to it, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just keep going forward because this is a big ticket item, yeah. obviously. No, for just for I meet with managers in the area every month, and it's one of our topics. We always talk about how can we look at sharing services going forward, because we know the strain it puts on community. So great, it's on it's on our minds all the time. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I move <laughs> that we authorize the um, purchase and finance of the 2022 Volvo EWR 130. There a second. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Directly. Thank you. No, really. <laughs> okay. I guess we're all set. No. <laughs> Charlie, come on up. Uh, so lastly, um, as the board is aware, um, try, um, a few weeks ago, the Woodstock Aqueduct held a public forum uh, to talk about their current state of operations and uh, their um, suggestions for going forward. Um, with that in mind, uh, a resident, Charlie Kimball, uh, approached me about forming a working committee uh, that could kind of look into this process um, throughout the day and kind of keep the ball rolling on those conversations and then act as a kind of investigative team for both boards to kind of see what is the best option. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned before, with the Harvard Business School helping us out, this committee can also be an asset to them to provide the information they may need as well instead of coming to the boards or myself where time is limited. Uh, so Charlie's here to kind of talk about that in a grander scale and I'll leave it to you. Well, that was pretty much the presentation. <laughs> no, but uh, it was three weeks ago, just a little over three weeks ago, uh, when at the public meeting that Woodstock Equity Company presented what their current state is, what the options are, a lot of questions came up. Uh, and here we are three weeks later, and quickly the Woodstock Equity Company has a sense of urgency like if we didn't get together a group to actually pursue the answers to those questions, it'd be too late. Uh, so that was my concern in talking to Eric about it. The Harvard Business School can do some of it. They've got a short-term engagement 
so they can't answer a lot of the questions that have to be asked. Some of them can only be answered by Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Uh, some we have to answer from the perspective of the town. Um, so that was what I thought it would be a good idea in talking with Eric about really getting a committee together to pursue the answers to the questions that you need to have answered in order to really make a decision as to what you want to do with the board. Um, even stuff like, does the town want to own an aqueduct company? If the town wanted to own it, how would you finance it and who pays for it? Uh, and then could the town run an aqueduct company? Um, so those are just three fundamental questions. And there's a lot more. I mean, I wrote down all the questions that came up from the meeting. Um, and can go into them, but it seems like there's a lot more that need to be answered. So thinking about five persons uh, on a group uh, of representative from the select board, representative from the uh, trustees, um, either in a full active or just sit, sit and listen and figure out and monitor what's going on and that kind of stuff. Um, so that then there's representation across the community to see what's going on. And you're gonna be on the board? I was hoping I would still be involved with Ben at this for a couple of years now, trying to figure out what's going on, or at least a year and a half uh, with the Woodstock Aquatic Company. So yes, I would definitely be involved, or we want to be. And so the hope today is just kind of introduce this topic, and then uh, the select board meeting in two weeks, come back with hopefully the committee of five members at the board, and then you know Hold approve on. or you know uh, at least acknowledge that the work they're going to do. Okay. So nothing needs to be done today. This is just a style of the conversation, but I think if the board is willing, Charlie can come back in two weeks, I think, uh, and kind of give an update on where they are and hopefully, like I said, have five members ready to go. We had talked about other committees at our last meeting. That yes. It would be helpful if we, you know, just so we don't end up with one person on every committee. Yeah. Yep. We talked about all the committees at the same time. Okay. Is is the aqueduct wanting to sell? I, I'm they are. Yeah. So they're they're at a point now where they know they have to make a certain level of improvements to the system in order to meet the fire uh, hydrant requirement for pressure and capacity, and they don't have the money and they don't have the capacity to borrow that money uh, based on their financial condition. So they're faced with this problem of well, how do we do it? Um, so there are some potential ideas out there. I mean, the town could buy it. They could sell to a private equity company, which has happened in other places. They could try to continue on in their current role as the running and owning the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, but then what, how would they fund it? Yeah. Um, and so some of the things are, well, do they place a higher fee on what the town is charged for the fire hydrants, for higher fire hydrant fee? So those are a lot of things that uh, the Harvard Business School can be involved with some of that discussion, figuring that out. There's a question about how much do rate payers pay versus other water payers and other communities? We don't really know. I mean, it's really hard to tell. Um, but yeah, the Woodstock Act, in short answer is yeah, they want okay. to sell. They want to be out of the business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That means either the town or a private entity buys them out. You got it. Because you need the water. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you. There it is. Any other business? Say no to lunch. I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. We still have minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. August 29th minutes. Yep. The special meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now, anyone want to I'd make adjourn? a motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.